Welcome to the sermon podcast for First St. Charles United Methodist Church in downtown St. Charles, Missouri. We are so glad that you're here, and it's our prayer that you feel safe, welcome, and wanted in this space. If you're interested in finding out more about us or supporting our ministries, you can connect with us online at firststcharlesumc.org. Today's scripture comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 6. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In the living of these words, we are made disciples of Christ. Glory be to God. In her most famous book, Traveling Mercies, Anne Lamont admits... I went around saying for a long time that I'm not one of those Christians who's heavily into forgiveness, that I'm one of the other kind. Aren't there a lot of us who have been that other kind? We've been bruised and beaten, victims of circumstance and the cruel vagaries of an unfair life. We felt blows from words that wound and actions we don't understand. Does any of this strike home for you? Do you know what it is to be one of the other kind? The kind who are riddle at best, angry, judgmental, and not just a little defensive. We don't feel forgiven or that we need to be forgiven. And we're not in the least bit predisposed to forgive others. We wear our grudges as proudly as a cardinal's t-shirt. Forgiveness? It's some of the hardest work we could ever be asked to do. Sometimes, when we say a word like forgiveness, we think it's nice and sweet, that it's like spraying perfume. But forgiveness isn't like that. Some of us will recall a scandal in the mid-80s, 1980s that is, involving a famous television evangelist. He raped a staff member. He brushed it off as sex. But then he also defrauded thousands of his followers out of millions of dollars, gave himself a $3 million bonus, and smiled all the way just thanking Jesus till they arrested him. The press interviewed some of his followers. We saw them smiling into the camera and heard them say, we forgive Brother Jimmy. The Bible tells us to, and we just forgive him. And I thought, you know, We expect certain cynical types to shrug off the crimes of their cohorts because that's the world they're a part of. But here are church people in the face of grotesque and vicious corruption who showed no sign of anguish or outrage or grief, certainly not for the woman who was his victim or for those whom he defrauded. They just smiled and said, we forgive him. The nation shook its head in disgust. Saying, I forgive, is cheap. If we're so naive that we don't even get it, or if we do get it, but the hurt is so awful, we choose not to face it. Because we've proffered a cheap grace. Doesn't it make real forgiveness seem a bigger hill to climb? It's hard. It's tough. It's one of the hardest things we'll ever have to do. This is deeply true when we've been wounded in the most devastating ways. Someone has betrayed us or betrayed someone we love. Someone has abused us, or someone we love. Someone 
has abandoned us. Someone keeps repeating the same infuriating behaviors over and over, never changing. What can it mean to forgive this? How long does it take to forgive the hardest to forgive? And what if they're not in our lives anymore? They hurt you and disappear. They ghost you. How do you forgive someone you can't talk to? What if they're dead? How do we finish forgiving the dead? While we're at it, how shall we forgive the world for all its cruelty and for some, even this? How shall we forgive God? C.S. Lewis was right. Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Forgiveness is some of the hardest work we will ever do. And maybe you've heard the story that's told of two brothers who had finished eating dinner and were playing until bedtime. Somehow, the younger brother managed to hit his older sibling with a stick. Tears and bitter words followed. Charges and accusations were still flying when it came time for bed. Their mother tried to get the older child to forgive his brother before going to sleep. Then they prayed that cringe-worthy prayer. Many of us prayed as children, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Then the boys said amen. And the mother asked the older child if he had forgiven his brother. Well, okay, he said. I'll forgive him. But if I don't die in the morning, he better look out. Who or what do you need to forgive? Who better look out in the morning? It might be useful to know that the biblical word for forgiving literally means to release, to let go. That's what the commandment means, to let it go. And as much as it begrudges me, I can't help but admit that I can't say it without hearing Disney in my head. To forgive is to let it go, let it go, let it go. For years, I kept over my desk a little Ziggy cartoon. Ziggy is standing, looking at the end of a rope that's frayed at his feet. Sometimes, he says, getting a grip on your problems means knowing when to let go. We do so not just for others, but for ourselves. A French theologian says that forgiveness is an invitation to the imagination. Not a forgetfulness of the past. Forgiveness is an invitation to the future. Not a forgetfulness of the past. It's the risk of a future other than the one imposed by the past or by memory. We let it go, not because the past deserves it or someone else deserves it, but because our futures depend on it. Our futures depend on it. Coming at it from a different direction, One of my friends says that the line in the Lord's Prayer about forgiveness is what makes it such a dangerous and disturbing prayer. To pray it, he says, may be ill-advised. It's even worse in the original language. We say, forgive us as we forgive. But the text 
literally says, forgive us as we have forgiven. In other words, since we've already forgiven everyone who has ever offended us, God treat us the same as we have treated them. Ouch. Maybe because he knew how dangerous it is, dangerous it is to pray such a prayer, Jesus wanted to make sure we don't gloss over it. This is why immediately after the amen has been said on the prayer, and we come blinking back into the awareness of our surroundings, Jesus quickly qualifies it and intensifies it, saying, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Talk about a zinger. Does anyone else here really dislike Jesus making forgiveness conditional? I thought love was supposed to be unconditional, that forgiveness was unconditional. Forget for a moment whether or not it's trespasses or debts or sins. Just follow the verb. Forgive us as we forgive means this. To the extent that we forgive other people, that's how we expect you, God, will forgive us. Is the power of forgiveness that we give, the power of forgiveness that we receive, is its power that of the change wrought in us? Maybe you know that in the world of financial management, there are two streams of thought. One says that when tackling great debt, it's always better to start paying off the debtors to whom you owe the greatest percentage of interest. The credit cards, for instance, as opposed to your home mortgage or lower interest home loans. And, strictly from a numbers point of view, they're right. On the other hand, there are those who, like Dave Ramsey, tell us to pay off our smallest debt first. Knock out the little ones. Build momentum. Build your confidence. Start small. Build up. From a spiritual point of view, I get it. I went around saying for a long time that I'm not one of those Christians who's heavily into forgiveness, that I'm the other kind, said Anne Lamott. She continues. But even though it was funny and actually true, it started to be too painful to stay this way. They say, she says, that we're not punished for the sin, but by the sin. And I began to feel punished by my unwillingness to forgive. By the time I decided to become one of the ones who is heavily into forgiveness, she says, it was like trying to become a marathon runner in middle age. Everything inside me either recoiled as from a hot flame or laughed a little too hysterically. I tried to will myself into forgiving various people who had harmed me either directly or indirectly over the years. Four former presidents, three relatives, two old boyfriends, and one teacher in a pear tree. It was like the 12 days of Christmas meets taxi driver. But in the end, she says, I could only pretend that I had. I decided I was starting off with my sights aimed too high. 
as C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity, if we really want to learn how to forgive, perhaps we had better start with something easier than the Gestapo. So, I decided to put everyone I'd ever lived with, slept with, or been reviewed by on hold and started to, with someone I barely knew whom I'd only hated for a little while. The person she chose as the focus of her forgiveness was the parent of one of the children in her son's first grade class. Someone whose house is perfect, whose child is perfect, whose life is perfect. Lamont describes her as an enemy light. Do you have anyone in your life you know to be your enemy light? And it makes sense, doesn't it? To start learning to forgive in small measures with small grudges and wrongs done to us. Except for one thing. Jesus doesn't make any exceptions and doesn't offer any loopholes. There's no codicil or footnoted listing of special cases. Maybe he knew we might have an enemy light, but there's no such thing as a Christian light. Maybe he knew that we may long for justice, but we need mercy most of all, both the mercy we give and the mercy we get back.